I'm Pete Meyer, standing in for Jason Key. Uh, today's webinar is Tom Goddard, who's going to be talking to us about new developments with Chimera X. With that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Uh, before you get going, you, you, you'd mentioned how we want to have people asking questions. Do you want to go over that before you dive in? Sure, I'll, I'll talk about that. So first, uh, please do ask questions during the presentation. Um, it'll make the most sense that way because it will probably be a question about what you were just seeing. Feel free to interrupt. Uh, if nobody asks any questions, then I'm going to feel like I was just talking to my screen all morning. That won't be too fun. Um, if you can unmute, if you want to ask a question, the best way is just jump in and, and unmute your microphone and ask. Um, Otherwise, you can, there's a chat in this Fuse thing, and you can type your question, and hopefully I'll see it. Yep. And if, if Tom doesn't see it and I see it, then I will jump in with and pass it along. All right. So uh, I'm going to start up. I made some um, HTML page of everything I'm going to show you. So there's no need to take detailed notes on this stuff, um, because you'll be able to see it all on the web page. And I'll show you where that is uh, in a moment. First, I'm a programmer, and I developed Chimera, the molecular visualization program. But today, we're going to talk about Chimera X. And Chimera X is our next generation version of Chimera. Uh, we don't expect it to replace Chimera for maybe a couple years, two years from now or so, because uh, Chimera has so many features. Um, but Chimera X has features now that you might find useful, and I'm going to try to show you some of those today. Um, we're changing Chimera X every day. Uh, SB Grid has our alpha release from about two weeks ago. Um, but there are nightly builds. And if you want to try it, I suggest you Google for Chimera X and download the nightly build, because lots of things have changed. Some of the things I'll show you probably won't even work in the alpha release from two weeks ago. All right, um, I'm going to it's going to be mostly about movie making and focused on cryo EM. There are four things I want to talk about. Uh, one is ambient occlusion lighting. Uh, we'll look at how to make movies morphing atomic structures. I'm going to show you how to display the fit of all of your residues in density maps. And if we have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about how, make, how to make virtual reality immersive uh, videos. You can look on to view on your cell phone, or if you have a, a like VR headset like Oculus Rift or HTC Vive. Um, not sure if we'll have time for that or not. All right, so let's get. I'm going to start up Chimera X. Uh, I'm going to do a tricky thing right at the start here, and I'm going to load that HTML presentation right into Chimera X. Um, in this left-hand window, it shows a bunch of um, thumbnail images of data sets that I've been looking at recently, and I can just click on them. And one of them is my actual presentation. So let me click on this. Um, and I'm going to drop it, drag and drop it into my, into my log window, my little panel on the right. The reason I'm doing this, uh, one of the cool features of Chimera X is in this tutorial, I have a bunch of commands. Let me scroll down here, like open this first data set. And I can just click on these uh, commands, and they'll be executed in Chimera X. So if after this you want to sort of fiddle with Chimera X, you might bring up this tutorial and click on these links. Um, and I'll show you at the end where the tutorial is. I magically got it because I had opened it earlier. Um, all right, so first thing, we're going to look at ambient occlusion lighting. This is uh, so. I'm going to open a cryo EM map, a rotavirus map. I said I could clink the links, but I'm going to type a lot of them because I think the pacing is better. So I say open uh, 5199 from, that's the EMDB ID code from EMDB. Uh, normally, that would take longer because it would have to fetch it, but it's I fetched it before, so it's cached on my machine. Um, well, one thing I said I was going to look at chat, but I don't even have chat up. Let me see if I get my my chat up in case some of you guys have questions. I'll be able to see them. Just one second, and I'll be back. 
Okay, there we go. I may not, if you ask a question, I don't guarantee I can. I'll well, I haven't seen any chat mis messages or raised flags that you've missed so far. Okay, so. Peter, make sure to tell me if you see one. Um, yes. So this is a rotavirus, uh, cryo-EM, it's at four angstroms from the Harrison lab. It's just a octant of the map because the full map is uh, big. This, if we look at the lower right, panel with the histogram, it says the map is 500 cubed grid points. So the full virus would be 1,000 by 1,000 by 1,000, which would be big. Um, anyways, they deposited just an octant. I can move this little vertical bar on the histogram to change the threshold level. So I'll go to a lower threshold by dragging that. You guys who are, a lot of this will be familiar, you're familiar with Chimera. Um, so, uh, one other thing to point out, though, if you haven't used Chimera, it's not showing it at full resolution. This step two that it is over the histogram means it's showing only every second data point along each of the axes. So if I change to step one, that will show me the full resolution data. All right, that was all just to get you guys oriented if you're not real familiar with Chimera and its interface. Um, what I really want to show you, this was supposed to be about ambient occlusion lighting. And so the lighting on this density map um, is shadowing all of the recessed areas. And so it gives very nice depth perception, um, very easy to see the depth in the structure. Um, and that's what I mean by the ambient occlusion lighting. What it, I mean, in simpler terms, it's just shadows cast from light that's coming from all directions. So areas that are recessed or indented don't get much light, and so they're darker. Um, to see, um, to, for a comparison, what this would look like in Chimera and most other software, uh, I'll switch to the standard lighting. So the standard kind of lighting you'd see on your maps and models is like this, because it doesn't have this fancy shadowing. Um, and in Chimera, you could turn on a single shadow, and other software also supports that. Let me turn on a single shadow. To, to do these things, to switch the lighting, I'm clicking on some icons on the top bar here. So I'll turn on the single shadow, and that's a little bit better in seeing the depth. But this ambient shadowing, I think, really makes it stand out. Um, every time I look at, at EM papers of big structures these days, uh, since I've had this ambient lighting for about a year now while I'm working on Chimera X, I think, oh man, that figure looks horrible. It would look so much better with this because you see the depth so well. So this is one of the reasons you might want to make a movie in Chimera X instead of Chimera 1, that you could make use of this nice lighting. So it also works, uh, works fine on uh, atomic models. It will work on any of the models. So let me open a, a model of... Uh, the rotavirus asymmetric unit. Uh, let me see what the PDB ID was of that. 4V7Q. A lot of the Chimera X, um, a way in which it's not as developed as, as Chimera, uh, is it doesn't have all as many graphical user interfaces. So I type more, end up typing more commands and have to know more commands. So you should keep that in mind if you're want to give it a try. It's, it's a fair bit of typing commands. So I've opened the atomic model. Here I'll hide the, the map. Again, it, it has nice, um, this, this is the nice lighting mode and compared to the sort of Chimera 1 style lighting, um, there's just, it, it just looks so much better with the ambient occlusion shadowing. So Tom, right. one question about that. Sure. Uh, with, it sounds like with this lighting model, there's no need to adjust parameters to make the, the lights or the shadowing look better? Oh, uh, that's a good question, yeah. Um, I tried to tune the parameters. There are a couple parameters. So I'll tell you technically what it's doing is um, casting shadows from 64 different directions. Okay, uniformly around the scene, 64 directions. So that's one parameter, 64. And sometimes I can get better quality. I could up that to 256, say. Uh, for instance, I could say light 
actually, if I just say light, um, and I switch over here to my log panel, it tells me the lighting parameters, and it tells me at the bottom, multi shadow 64. I could say light multi shadow uh, 256, and then it will compute it from 256 directions. And I saw it make a tiny little difference, but generally it doesn't make much difference. Um, okay. So, and we, uh, we, so we've got a question from Audrey M in the audience by chat. Uh, okay. Asking what kind of machine you'd need for smooth display of shadows. Ah, uh, good. Another excellent question. I, I miss all these important things. I'm glad you guys are asking. Um, I'm running on an iMac here that's uh, from 2012, but with pretty nice graphics from 2012. But that we are talking five years old. That's kind of pushing it, like using a five-year-old machine, because we really are. Um, we we're trying to make maximum use of the graphics. And so it's good to have good graphics. And we recommend you have a machine that's say uh, three years old or newer, okay? So that it has the fast enough graphics. If you go on an older, your five-year-old laptop, um, it will do this, I think. Most, well, most of them will, but it may be um, more sluggish. And here, um, it, here it's rotating very smoothly for me. Um, and with a big map also, but um, when you when I'll notice it even on this machine, the poor performance is when it first computes the shadows. Like if I redisplay the map, it may pause for a second because it's doing the shadow computation from 64 different directions. Oh, it only does that when the scene changes, like when I show a new model. Okay, are there any more questions about the ambient lighting? Shadowing? Doesn't look that way. Okay, good. Those were good questions. I like those. Um, so I think, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to show you a few more things. Just uh, these are things you can do in Chimera 1, but for maybe uh, not everybody is familiar with how to do them. So I'm going to show uh, the map again. And what if I wanted to color the map? an asymmetric unit using the colors from this atomic model. Um, there's a capability called color zone to do that. And so let me uh, do that. I'll say color number one, that's the ID number of the map. Uh, zone number two, that's the ID number of the model. We see these ID numbers in the panel on the right hand side. And I have to say, how far out should the coloring go away from the atoms? I'll say distance uh, five angstroms. So let's do that. I could hardly see a change, but it actually colored the map to show that I'll hide the model on uh, the models panel on the right hand side. I'll click off the shown button. That will get rid of the atomic model from the scene. Or we'll undisplay it. And so I, here I have. Um, the map where that atomic model was colored to match the color of those atoms. Um, sometimes that's useful in making figures. You see that there's a kind of a snowstorm here because I've set the contour level fairly low. Um, and so we have little noise around the density map. And I'd like to hide that. So another feature, um, there's something called hide, du hide dust. You might know this from Chimera 1. So I can hide it. In Chimera 1, this color zone capability, there's a dialog, a little window to do it, and there's a command to do it. And for hiding dust, again, there's a little window to do it. But we don't have the little windows, uh, which make it easier to do. We don't have those in Chimera X yet. So I'll type the command, surface dust number one. That's this map. And I have to say how big the little speckles should be that should be hidden. I'll say five angstroms. So any little speckle, little pieces of the surface that are smaller in size than five angstroms will be hidden. This takes a second to compute because it's a big map. There we go. So they're gone. Is that five angstroms radius or five angstroms diameter? Oh, uh, it's diameter. So um, each little connected piece of the surface it looks at its size, I think along the X, Y, and Z axis, it looks at its maximum size. And if its maximum size along the X, Y, and Z axis of a little connected piece is 
less than five angstroms, it just hides it. It didn't change your map. Okay, so that that's uh, all of this is just to um, show you a little bit of what's available in terms you can manipulate your density maps in Chimera X like you can in Chimera One. And the one new thing I showed you uh, was this very nice lighting mode. All right, next on to morphing. So what am I going to do here? I think I'm going to close this. Yeah, we're looking at we're going to look at a different virus structure for morphing. So I'm type command close. Um, this is this virus structure we'll look at now is called and we're going to look at morphing the atomic models. Uh, have it in different conformations. It's called deformed wing virus, and it infects honeybees. It was published just last month in uh, Proceedings of National Academy. Uh, I was very interested in it when I looked, saw it last week because I have a, um, a hive of bees in my backyard and the bees die off occasionally. Like I've had it for five years and mine disappeared last year. This, this pathogen supposedly is a, they claim is a major cause of the honeybees dying off. Anyways, it was also very cool research. Um, they have both a crystal structure, X-ray structure, and a cryo-EM structure. And in a weird twist, the cryo-EM structure is higher resolution. It's at 3.1 angstroms resolution, um, whereas the X-ray, I think, was at 3.8 angstroms. Mm -hmm. So let's, and I mean, OK, that's fine. But what was really interesting is the X-ray structure is very different from the cryo-EM structure. So let's look at two atomic models that they fit to the X-ray and cryo-EM. So first I'll open the cryo-EM one. It's this 5MV5, um, that's the PDB ID. I'm gonna just click this link over here. And when I do it, it just inserted the command here and ran it. So it's opened this uh, structure. That's the cryo-EM model of the asymmetric unit for this virus. And I can open 5G52 again by just clicking the link. This is what I was telling you about a second ago, uh, earlier, about how you can run the tutorials very easily without having to type all the commands. So the two structures aren't aligned. They were fit into the density maps, and the density maps, I guess, weren't aligned with each other. So the first step I want to do to morph them and compare them is to align them. I'll use a command called matchmaker to do that. Matchmaker uh, number two to number one. So this just does an alignment. Click that. Uh, it did a sequence alignment first. I think the sequences are identical for these two structures, but often you'll um, be aligning like homologous structures where the sequences are different. So it would do a sequence alignment, and then it minimizes the root mean square deviation between the C alpha atoms. So here it is aligned. And we can see uh, the ribbons like follow each other very closely in part of the structure. Uh, but up at the top, there's a blue domain and a brown domain, the same domain from the two structures that are in totally different positions. So let's, uh, to see this, sometimes it's easier to see this in a morph. In fact, I think almost always it's easier to see it in a morph than it by putting them on top of each other. Um, so let's make a morph. This matchmaker thing is also in Chimera 1. Um, I'll say morph number one to number two. Those are the model ID numbers. This takes a, a few seconds to calculate and then a new model will pop up here and um, it will show me the motion. So we see the domain just uh, rotates and moves. It moves about 40 angstroms, so, and it rotates, uh, I think, 145 degrees. Um, I can run that again. Um, I won't use the morph command um, because that will recompute, and it, I don't want to waste the time to recompute it. I, the morph made a coordinate set, so there were 21 frames that it, in, it interpolated. Um, and I can say coordinate set number three. It made this model number three. Let me show you that. Oh yeah, it's here in the model panel over here. 
and it that model has these 21 frames. I know that because if I usually I'll have the log up if I go over to the log under, after my morph command, it says computed 21 frame morph model number three. So this chord set command allows playing through any coordinate set. It might be a molecular dynamics trajectory, but in this case, it's this morph. And so that allows me to play through it again. Okay, and what do we want to do next with this thing? Uh, oh, one thing is, I should have done this a little while ago. Um, there are actually three proteins here in the asymmetric unit. So let me color those three different colors. There's a little icon at the top to do this coloring. There are a few different choices, but I'll, I'll click that. Um, this little, when I click that icon, it actually corresponded to a command two. And so let me switch back to the log here. It's really useful to have the log up. Um, it, this last command in the, uh, log color selected atoms by chain. That's what made this three atom coloring. And that appeared in the log because I pressed the icon. Okay. So, uh, so how do we make a, let's just make a simple movie, our first movie uh, that shows this motion. So I, I got the chord set command that does the motion and to make a movie out of it, I'll just add a few more commands. So I'll start, it's gonna be a series of four commands. I'll say movie record, and then I'm gonna put a semicolon, semicolon separate commands, cause I'm gonna put all four of these commands just on one line. Movie record, semicolon, then my coordinate set command to play it. And then I'll say wait 25, that says draw 25 frames. Uh, the morph is only 21 frames, so there'll be four extra ones at the end when nothing is changing. Semicolon, then movie, encode, and I'll tell it to put it on the desktop, tilde desktop, uh, say call it deformed wing virus MP4. Okay, now it's um, capturing images. That's what the movie record does as the domain moves. Uh, did save it save 25 images and then it encoded it in an mp4 movie file so it says in the status line at the very bottom here movie saved to goddard desktop this file let's go look for that uh, here it is my desktop let me play that one thing you'll notice is it's it's playing back faster then it recorded. The playback by default is at 25 frames per second. So even if Chimera X couldn't keep up with 25 frames per second because it was saving all of these image files, um, the playback for the movie is gonna be at the 25 frames per second. It's a number you can change too if you wanted it to go at a different frame rate. Okay. All right, good. So, so that's kind of interesting, but it, it's much more interesting to see um, what does this domain motion look like on the full virus capsid. And uh, so let's try to take a look at that. So I'm gonna take this um, model and make the full virus capsid. There's a command to do that called sim, which applies symmetry. Say sim number three, that's the morph. Um, and then I tell it the symmetry, um, it's icosahedral symmetry and there are different orientation reference frames for icosahedral symmetry. And I had to figure this one out. It's the most common kind where two fold symmetry axes are along X, Y, and Z. So I say two, 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 that's the name of that reference frame for icosahedral symmetry. It then makes the 60 copies. It didn't actually copy the molecular structure. That would have taken a, a lot longer to make copies and have half a million atoms or a million atoms. Um, instead, it just is redisplaying the same copy 60 times. That's why it was so fast to come up. Um, in order to take advantage of that, of the nicer lighting that I showed you, it doesn't, um, you don't really see a good shadowing effect with ribbons because there's too much empty space. So let me change to 
uh, all atom display with spheres, and then the lighting will look a lot nicer. Up in the top on the toolbar here, I can hide the ribbons with the little ribbon outline icon, and I can show the atoms with the first icon on the left, the sphere, and I think they're being shown as stick or ball and stick. This uh, thing that looks the red, white, and blue kind of water molecule looking thing um, switches to from stick mode to spheres. Um, and I don't have the fancy lighting on right now. Let me click that on. Um, and here, I clicked it just like two seconds ago. It took almost two seconds to compute the lighting on this. Uh, it would help to have a more modern graphics card. That would have been faster. When I rotate it around now, another like idea of the performance, now it's only rotating at maybe, I don't know, three to five frames per second. It's a little bit sl sluggish, um, but, it, but it looks pretty beautiful, at least on my screen. Um, and now I can play that morph. Um, Actually, this is where if I play the morph right now, it's going to have to recompute those shadows at every frame. And um, that's going to be slow. And so I know it's going to be somewhat slow because it seemed to take a second or two for each for the shadow computation initially. So I'm going to switch back to the, the ugly flat lighting. And then I'm going to play the morph, this chord set command, chord number 3, 1 to 21. So that's what it looks like. The domains, um, they start in the middle of the five, near the five-fold axis. Um, that's the cryo-EM structure. And then when they're spread far away, when they kind of unfold like petals, that's the X-ray structure. Now, of course, I want to do this with the good lighting. And so I wish I had a GTX 1080, like state-of-the-art graphics card uh, on my machine, but I don't. Um, but I can record a movie of it at least. And um, I'll, let's switch to the good lighting. Um, there we go. And I'll do that same recording command. In fact, exactly the same command. Um, let me go back to it. I clicked on a little, the little um, down arrow on the right, which gives me a history of my <laughs> recent commands. And so here's that movie record command. So let's put that in the command line. I'll hit return here. Um, so now it's, it's going to step through playing the 21 frames. You'll see it change, but it's changing very slowly. And it's changing slowly because of that shadow computation. Um, and then it will record a movie uh, in a, well, it's going to overwrite. I didn't change the file name. So it's going to overwrite the dwarf right, uh, uh, deformed wing virus dwv.mp4 file in a second. Um, so let's see, while we're waiting for that, let me see what I'm going to show you next. Whoops. Oh, I can't scroll that. Okay, blah, blah, blah. This is a, I One don't know. While we're waiting, uh -huh. is it possible, like, if you had a compute server someplace and you, you had things set up where you knew what you wanted your movie to do, could you do this on a CPU with no graphics? Um, you can, we've played with it. Um, your GPU is of course a lot faster than the CPU typically, like 10 to a hundred times faster. Um, and so that's going to be slow. Um, but you might have a lot of time on a server. Um, more typically what I would do is this isn't a big movie, this, and it's finished here, but this is a, but sometimes I make a one minute movie that has a lot of different segments. And I interpolated 100 frames on this morph. And then I made it even more complicated. And, um, and it might take five hours to render um, because it's rendering thousands of frames, not just 25 frames. Uh, 25 frames is a one second movie. Uh, so um, so uh, I run it overnight, typically, on my desktop. That's, oh. That would be the more typical, that would, that's my typical use. Um, it is possible to do what you say. Um, there's a ver special version which can run without the graphics card, of, uh, only on Linux though. So let me just show you the movie we just recorded. All right, and um, actually maybe... before you jump to that, we have a question from Yan sure. Zhang in the audience. And yes, a couple of minutes ago, I, I missed it, so I apologize for that. 
And oh, it was no. asking about what the wait 25 command does. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that was the most cryptic, cryptic part of, of the thing for sure. Uh, see if it's still up here. Um, so that coordinate set command that precedes the wait command says flip through the 21 frames. Um, and when you type that command, it doesn't wait. It doesn't, uh, it, it immediately goes to the next command. It doesn't finish the 21 frames and then go to the next command. It just goes on to the next command immediately. So if I left the wait 25 out, then the next command would be encode the movie and it would encode the movie and it had no frames because it just, um, and so why does it do this bad thing? That seems like unfortunate behavior, but it's actually pretty useful. Um, the idea is what if I wanted it to play that morph with the coordinate set command and move the virus, say zoom out. I could put another command in to say zoom out but I want to do it at the same time. I want the morph to change and zoom out at the same time. So the way it actually works, you can do that. You say coordinate set, and then the next command you say zoom out, and then you say wait 25. And both the coordinate set and zoom, those commands um, don't actually draw any frames. They just get those processes started. And then the wait 25 is what actually draws the frames. I was thinking of renaming this wait command, that's its name in Chimera 1, to draw, draw 25 frames. Uh -huh. So in order to get any frames in your movie, you need this wait command. Um, and so often for a more complicated movie where I have 10 commands, because it's doing a number of things besides a morph, every other command is wait. Now wait for 50 frames, now wait for 60 frames, or wait for 10 frames. So that's the most tricky part about this movie scripting. Uh, so it's a good, good question. Okay, let me show you the, what that movie looks like. So here's with our nice lighting. And I just loop, I put the little player on loop. There's some weird thing going on in the five-fold pour too, in the blue part in the middle. All right. Okay, are there more questions? I think that's it for morphing. And we're gonna go on to have the fitting of residues, showing the fit of residues in density maps. So I don't, I don't think we have any more questions or at least I haven't, haven't okay. seen any. Okay, so, um, right. So um, let's take a look at, for this deformed wing virus, how well the, uh, how good the density, the cryo EM density is. And to do, we're going to look at um, how well each residue fits into the density. And we can make a movie of that, showing that, which you might use, say, a supplementary material for your journal article so that you can convince people, yeah, your density is really 3.1 angstroms. All right, so I'm going to, um, let me close uh, the X-ray structure. And the more close number two and three. Let me show our uh, cryo EM structure there. Maybe I'll show it a stick. And let me open the cryo EM map. And what was its EMDB ID? Let me see. 3574. Open 3574 from EMDB. Okay, good. And then I'm going to use a command, and this is only in Chimera X. It's called resfit, residue fit in maps. I'll say resfit uh, number. Uh, actually, now I don't remember the syntax of the command. Okay. Let's I say I want to fit, I want to see the residues of chain A um, in map number two. Okay, so let's do that. Um, this slider came up at the very top of the window and it changed the display. That's what this resfit command did so that I can see the very first residue of chain A and I see the density there. And 
up at the top, uh, the slider at the right, there's a little play button that I'll, I'll press, the little right arrow triangle button. And it will just sequence through from one residue to the next. You see a little label in the text window, threonine 8, valine 9, leucine 10, asparagine 11, threonine 12. And it just shows a zone of the density near that particular residue and the neighboring residues on either side. Um, as it's moving, you see it some as it moves to the next residue, it hides some of the neighboring residues, so you see those disappear, um, and it recomputes the zone. The reason it's making a zone to show the density map around that residue is you don't want other density that's in front obscuring your view. Okay, so I can play through. There's a little slider here at the top, and so I can just move the slider to look at any particular residue just interactively. And at the far right of this bar at the top, there's this uh, red circle. That's a record button. So I can just record a movie. So if I press that, now it's going to sequence through. You see it's going a little bit slower here, um, but it's also capturing image frames to make a movie. Uh, it shows me that in the status line at the bottom. So I can record for a little while here. I think I oriented it kind of in a funny way. And then you could wait to the end. Okay, this is a job that would take a long time to run at the rate it's going. It might take me another 15 minutes to record this all the way to the end. Um, but I can just press the little red square at the right to stop the recording, and then it will make the movie of those residues that we've already shown. So let me press that. At the status line, it says started encoding 700 frames. That's how long our movie was, that, that section I recorded. It says it saved it to the desktop. This is, again, at the status line at the bottom in a file called resfit.mp4. That's the movie file. Let's look for that. Let's hide our virus. Here it is. Let's see what we got. So it just shows what we were seeing on the screen there. What's kind of nice about this in terms of um, using it in the way I described for supplementary material, if I have a thousand residue protein, this movie is 30 minutes long. Okay, at the rate it's going, the standard rate it uses, and you can adjust the rate with an, arg an extra option to the ResFit command. Um, but for a thousand residues, it takes 30 minutes. Nobody's gonna watch it for 30 minutes, of course. But you can just move this, the slider through it very quickly. You can see what residue, if you're interested in particular residues in the binding site, you can just very quickly move through and see the, the fit of those residues that are critical to say the function of the protein. Okay, so that's the fitting of residues. Are there any questions about that? Showing the fit of residues in the density map? Yeah, I'll, so I'll turn off screen sharing then because I think uh, Screen share, stop sharing. I want to show a few things in my video camera. If okay, am I bigger on the for your screen now? You are definitely bigger. Okay, excellent. So virtual reality. Uh, let me uh, get start up my cell phone here and show you something. Um, you know there are these virtual reality headsets, and uh, they look like you know like. Google Cardboard, and you you put your cell phone in it, your cell phone in here, and it's got the lenses, and you see the scene all around you. Like I can be inside the virus, say at the five-fold axis of this virus we just looked at, and I can look all around, and it's as if it's floating in space here. Here's a, this is that virus, and it's on my cell phone, and there are two images. Um, a left eye and a right eye one, because you need different images so that you get the 3D depth perception. It's stereoscopic. And uh, as I move my phone, the image changes. Um, yep, to... we, we can see that pretty clearly. We, we, we're not getting the depth effect, but- Yeah, we... you won't get the depth effect. I'm not getting it either, because <laughs> for, that, for that, you need 
one of these yep. or here's a fancier version of it okay just some lenses because i can't focus on my cell phone when it's two inches in front of my face but i take this and i put my cell phone in it here like so and then i go here and i'm inside the virus that's pretty crazy looking this is, is pretty gee whiz movies or can you can you do three dimension can you control so, the view inside of it so this is a still image this is a still scene okay of inside the virus where i i stationed myself at the uh fivefold inside the fivefold pore of the virus um but i could have easily it could just as easily be a movie that's playing through where a morph is happening like I'm inside the fivefold pore and this big domain is coming at me. Uh, so you can have movies or still images. I'm using, uh, this is on an iPhone and I'm using Mobile VR Station. That's the name of an app because you need a special app that can play this kind of movie or this kind of stereoscopic image. Um, I'm not sure what the app is on Android because I have this Apple phone and I haven't played around with it on Android, but there are apps, there are multiple apps that can play these things. So I wanna show you just briefly, just in a, a minute, how do I record such a thing in Chimera X? Again, this Quick is a feature before just... you jump to that. Uh -huh. uh, we, we had a question about who was the, the, what was the make and model of your non-cardboard holder? This, this one is called Merge, uh, Merge 360. Okay. It's made out of foam. It's pretty cool. This is this is your like super high end version. This is fifty bucks. It's got some nice big lenses in it. This the Google Cardboard, ten bucks or something, maybe five even if you find a good deal. This one is uh, this one I like a lot. is called Fit VR F I I T and uh, two VR two S. This one has a little different mechanism for putting your phone in. It just, you put your phone in there and you snap it shut. It's got big lenses. It has a little adjustment on the bottom to control how far apart the two lenses are because people's eye separation differ. And this one's only 20 bucks. It has a nice head strap. So, and it's yeah. even lighter than the purple one. So there are a lot of choices and you go online, they're, 20 different people making different versions of these things. And I just chose a few that had decent reviews um, to play with. But let me tell you before, I don't mean to make an advertising pitch for this because I feel it's, it's a little bit gee whiz. This isn't really gonna help you that much with your research. Um, I, I'm more interested in the virtual reality that uses the desktop, um, like a very expensive $800 Oculus Rift or HTC Vive. We have those here and those work with Chimera X. And the difference with using those is Chimera X renders those live. And so it's not a pre recorded movie. And the problem with a pre recorded movie is if the movie was me in the five fold pour, I can't move out of the five fold pour because that's where the movie was recorded from. But if I do it live with the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift, I can simply like walk a little bit and I can see, go to the threefold vertex of the virus. Um, so it's a, it's a much better experience, but it's a much more expensive toy. Yeah. Um, well, I, I wouldn't call it a toy because I, I, I go back to the days of doing stereo on CRT monitors and probably you do and some of our audience does as well. So this sounds like an yeah, it's, that I wished we'd had 10 years ago. It, it's worth trying. I just don't want to you'd get your hopes up too much for the cell phone version, especially. Um, and in my iPhone 5 here, this thing is like four years old or five years old. The graphics isn't up to it. As I move my head around, it stutters and it can make you sick. Like I'd recommend you have a Samsung S6 or S7 or some new phone that has powerful graphics to do it on your cell phone. Um, so let me show you the one critical step in Chimera X. I'm gonna go back to screen sharing that will allow you to make these scenes that you could try on your cell phone, or you can try if you have an Oculus Rift, uh, if you're lucky enough or a gamer or something and you bought one of these things. Um, so are we back to screen sharing? We are. And okay. I'm screen. 
So um, let me let me close this. Let me open. Uh, I'll reopen my uh, atomic model and color it. And the key thing to know is there's a special mode that does the 360 degree view that you need. And to enable that, I say camera 360. And I'm going to say TB, that stands for top and bottom. So let me hit that. And it just split my graphics into a top half and a bottom half. And the top half is the left eye and the bottom half is the right eye. This is the format that's needed by the mobile VR station program or the other programs that can play these 360 degree scenes that can show them. Um, and so I zoom, I see all kinds of weird distortion because from the left edge of the screen to the right edge of the screen, that's um, like zero to 360 degrees around. Okay, it's like a map projection. And from the bottom to the top is like from the South Pole to the North Pole, or the angle, the az azimuth angle or latitude. Uh, and I can record, save this image right here. Um, the part that, so I would just say save, uh, say to the desktop. Um, this is my uh, deformed wing virus 360.png. I'm gonna save a single image instead of a movie as an example, but you can save movies too. Um, just with the same movie command, the movie record command we saw, you just put it in this camera mode and you record a movie and you get it in this form. For it to look good, you need very high resolution because um, this is covering a whole 360 degrees. And so I would make a, I'm gonna make a 4,000 by 4,000 pixel image bigger. So it's bigger than my screen. I'm gonna do that by specifying the width is 4,096, that's 4K. And the height is 496. These could be different numbers, but this is in the ballpark. And I just hit return and it's saving this PNG image to my desktop. Let's see if, if it's there now. Here, oops, here it is. Oops, let me get rid of this. It's over here. So I bring it up. It's pretty huge. If I say view it at the actual size. Oh, oops. View actual size. You see it's, it's pretty gigantic. Um, but uh, that's the kind of image. I just took that image and I transferred it to my cell phone and I looked at it in mobile VR station. So it's just this camera, this special camera mode that allows you to do these VR recordings. Okay, so that, that's all I, I wanted to tell you about VR. Um, and uh, you can give it a try if you want. Uh, but as I say, I think the things I showed you earlier will be more useful in your research. And this is sort of, maybe this is coming in the future. The equipment will get better. The graphics hardware will be better. And uh, maybe your cell phone will be powerful enough so that it could do it live interactively instead of a pre-recorded image. I'll be able to move around the scene with just my cell phone and one of these headsets. Cool. Okay, so that's... Uh, that's what I got. All right. Are well, there any remaining questions? Hey, you guys, you guys had some good questions. Next time, I want you to ask twice as many, though. <laughs> I think uh, the things you asked were the most important things. More important than what I told you, the things I was prepared to tell you. So, okay. Thank well, you. thanks for attending.